The Federal Reserve has many roles, but its single most important responsibility is to control the nation's money supply. Remember that monetary policy is changes to the money supply in order to achieve particular macroeconomic goals. And in the U.S., the Fed controls monetary policy and the money supply. Making more money available, expansionary policy, makes it easier to spend, so aggregate demand increases. Making less money available, contractionary policy, makes it more difficult to spend, so aggregate demand falls. The question now is, how does the Fed control or make changes to the money supply? The Fed has three major tools to control the money supply. One, open market operations, or OMOs. Two, the required reserve ratio. Three, the discount rate. How does each of these work, and which tool or tools does the Fed prefer? Let's take them one at a time. One, open market operations. Just as with fiscal policy, monetary policy can be either expansionary, stimulating the economy, or contractionary, slowing the economy. If open market operations are the buying and selling of government securities, which is expansionary and which is contractionary? Let's look at an example of an open market purchase, where the Fed buys $1 million of securities, or government bonds, from Wells Fargo. The Fed sees a change in its asset mix as it increases its holdings of securities and decreases its holdings of cash, depositing a million dollars into Wells Fargo's account. Wells Fargo also sees a change in its asset mix with a million dollars less in government securities but a million dollars more on deposit with the Fed. The big difference is that a million dollars in securities can't be loaned out, but a million dollars in bank reserves, or at least some fraction of it, can be lent out. With the open market purchase, the Fed has injected $1 million into the economy, plus whatever additional effect from the lending of the excess reserves, making this expansionary policy. What about an open market sale? Let's say that the Fed sells $1 million of government securities to Bank One. The Fed sees a decrease in its holdings of securities, but Bank One pays the Fed $1 million. Actually, the Fed just deducts the amount from Bank One's Federal Reserve deposits. Bank One now has $1 million less on deposit at the Fed. That's $1 million less in actual bank reserves, but has $1 million more in securities. What this means is that Bank One now has less money to lend, and less money in circulation means less spending, slowing down the economy. Therefore, an open market sale is contractionary monetary policy. What about the second tool, the required reserve ratio? We've seen this one in action already when we examined how the banking system creates money, but let me recap. Recall that the maximum change in checkable deposits, and therefore the money supply, is 1 over the required reserve ratio times the initial change in reserves. For example, if the change in reserves is $500 and the required reserve ratio, that is, the percentage of total deposits that the bank is legally required to hold on to, is 10%, then the maximum change in the money supply is 1 over 0.1 times 500, or 10, the money multiplier, times 500, or $5,000. Now, what if the Fed increases the required reserve ratio to 20%? Technically, according to the Monetary Control Act of 1980, the Fed is only allowed a range from 8% to 14%, but let's just use 20% hypothetically. It makes the math easier. What's going to be the new maximum possible change in the money supply? With a required reserve ratio of 0.2, that's 20%, the multiplier is now 1 over 0.2, or 5. So the maximum change is 5 times $500, or 2500 This means that raising the reserve requirement is contractionary monetary policy, since the overall possible change is half what it was before, slowing the economy. This makes sense, since a higher reserve ratio means that banks are legally required to hold on to more reserves, leaving less to lend out. What if the Fed decreases the reserve requirement to 5%? Now the multiplier, 1 over R, or 1 over 0.05, is 20, so a $500 change in reserves can make up to a $10,000 difference in the money supply. Decreasing the required reserve ratio makes more money available for lending, thereby increasing spending in the economy and expansionary monetary policy. The third tool, the discount rate, is the interest rate at which commercial banks can borrow from the Fed. This one is pretty common sense. At a higher interest rate, banks are less inclined to borrow, which slows the economy or contractionary policy. At a lower interest rate, banks are more inclined to borrow, putting more money in circulation and stimulating the economy, 
expansionary policy. Here's the kicker, though. Sometimes, even at very attractive rates, banks don't want to borrow from the Fed. To borrow money, a bank can go to other commercial banks or they can go to the Fed. Borrowing from other banks means entering the federal funds market and being subject to the federal funds rate, the interest rate that banks charge each other. Borrowing from the Fed means paying the discount rate or the rate at which the Fed lends to member banks. Which will the borrowing bank choose? You'd think it would be the lower interest rate, wouldn't you? Well, oddly enough, even if the discount rate is less than the federal funds rate, a bank still may go to the federal funds market for the loan. Why? Well, for a few reasons, really. First, there's the purpose of the loan. That is, the Fed frowns on making loans for risky profit ventures. Second, consider the Fed bureaucracy. Among the functions of the Fed, one is to supervise member banks. Do you want to ask your supervisory entity for a loan or multiple loans? Borrowing too often from the Fed might look like bad management, opening your bank up to an audit. Third, there's the fact that borrowing from the Fed is a privilege, not a right for member banks. If you abuse the privilege, you may be turned down in the future. For all of these reasons, the Fed is referred to as the lender of last resort. So which tool, OMOs, the required reserve ratio, or the discount rate, does the Fed prefer to use? The Fed tends to use open market operations the most for several reasons. One, OMOs are flexible. The Fed can conduct sales or purchases in any dollar amount that they want. Two, OMOs are reversible. If the Fed conducts an open market purchase today, it can turn right around and conduct an open market sale tomorrow. Three, quick implementation. Fed OMOs take place very rapidly as transactions occur electronically. You've seen the discount rate drawback. Many banks prefer not to borrow from the Fed unless absolutely necessary. And changing the required reserve ratio is like trying to use a sledgehammer on the economy. In the end, the Fed prefers to try fine-tuning the economy with OMOs. Next time, exchange rates.